Major funding for these programs is provided by HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Greenberg Traurig LP, The Moynian Group. Additional funding is provided by Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, Cushman and Wakefield, Essex Capital Partners, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers. Welcome to the Stoller Report. My name is Michael Stoller. Brooklyn, the borough. I love Brooklyn. They have the best cheesecake. They have Coney Island. They have the Cyclones. And one day they're going to have the Nets. But there's a lot going on in downtown Brooklyn where the Nets are. And today I have these four individuals who really know what's going on in downtown Brooklyn. I'd like to introduce Mark Freud, president, uh, principal of the Trapper Companies. Dean Palin, president of Palin Enterprises, Tim King, senior partner of Massey Knackle Realty Services, and last but not least, Phil Warden, vice president at Avalon Bay Communities. Timmy, you know, we were just saying before the show, five years ago, eight years ago, did you think that you'd see all these new developments, all this happening in downtown Brooklyn? And I confessed that I wasn't that good of a prophet. But I like to think that today, if you were to go on the roof of Dean's building and go in a hot air balloon and float up 500 feet and take some 360 degree photos and come back in three years and do the same shoot and follow that a couple of years later and lay them out side by side on a table, that people would think you'd visited three different planets. That's how much activity and construction is going on right now in downtown Brooklyn. I mean, but is part of the construction, and I think this is a question for all of you, is part of that construction due to the fact that many uh, developers, residential developers, have to be in the ground before December 21st, otherwise they're not going to get these tax abatements, guys? I Mark? Think, I think that uh, we were chatting about this a little bit earlier, but I think Brooklyn's a kaleidoscope of ethnicity. People like to be there. People feel a community. They, I was mentioning earlier that there's, uh, there's an enormous amount of uh, brain power, intellectual curiosity in the borough. You've got Mailer, you've got uh, Capote, you've got some wonderful authors that, that live in Brooklyn Heights. So I think people like the community, the human scale of Brooklyn. So I don't necessarily see it as only being uh, developers, as only being uh, there because of the need to be in the ground you know, prior to potential legislation changing. I think it's really uh, a question of people wanting to be there because it's a, pro it's a progressive uh, community to be a part of and people really want to live in Brooklyn. You know, with regard to that, here we have, uh, and we're not going to say it, but you're the proverbial 800-pound gorilla. Avalon Bay Communities is a public REIT, one of the largest residential developers of rental housing. You're building in, in, in Queens, uh, you know, Manhattan. You're building Westchester everywhere. Now you're building in, in downtown Brooklyn. How did you guys make a decision to go to downtown Brooklyn? Uh, well, we started looking in 2004, 2005. They'd done the upzoning. And uh, we're looking for neighborhoods that are convenient. And there are 11 subway lines within four blocks of the site that we're doing, that we're working on now, and that's a that's a big plus. Uh, we've seen the success in Long Island City of being a stop or two away from downtown, uh, and uh, we just see it as a, a logical place for people to go who want to rent are getting pushed out of the out of Manhattan by the high rents. Um, there's also Metro Tech across the street from us, which has 30,000 people going to work every day. So for us, it's a uh, 
it's a uh, it's an area that's already established. It's got a lot more amenities and and uh, uh, cultural activities than than we saw in Long Island City five years ago. Now, but you, but you're the only. I mean, not here specifically, but also the, what I, what I see, you're the only guys who are building true rental in downtown Brooklyn. Why 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 couldn't the dean who's building the Oro, this magnificent condominium, or Mark who's done a number of properties all over downtown Brooklyn and the Gowanus? Be building. Why, why aren't other residential developers going to build rental? I think they are going to start building rental. I think um, I think the the condo market, um, you know, may be flattening out, and I think some of the uh, some of the condo projects that were first uh, envisioned are going to end up being rental projects, and that's okay. I mean, for us, we can build where maybe some other people can't build rentals, in that we have a very low cost of capital because we're really borrowing against our whole portfolio at a corporate level. And we build, uh, we build. Uh, we're our own GC, so we're not facing as much cost pressure um, from the from the general contracting as, as some of our competitors. And we're building for the long term. So if we if we project a return of seven percent and ends up being six point eight percent that first year, we can. We're okay with that. We would rather be in there early and see the the yield grow over time. Whereas if you're a condo developer, you can you can make a killing if you hit it right, and if you miss. Your timing, your timing is much more crucial. So let's, let's speak to the two condo developers, okay? Dean, what are you building? Yeah. What are you you're building? This building Oro, there. and you tell, tell me why you you call it the Oro. I love this story. The or, uh, building's located on 306 Gold Street. So, uh, very simply, I named it Oro, in Spanish. It's gold but, in Spanish. But you know, I just heard Phil say, you know, the condo market is flattening in downtown Brooklyn. What do you see? Well, we were there uh, a little earlier than uh, Avalon, and at that time, there was a tremendous need for uh, condos in that area. Um, when I saw uh, four years ago, I saw the toy factory building uh, open up 60 units. I would have never guessed. My partner, Ron, uh, built that, and I would have never guessed, and there were lines, and it sold out very quickly. Uh, within six months, and that gave me the confidence to go across the street and and do this project. Mark, Mark, you you've been in downtown Brooklyn. I mean, you were there before Atlantic Yards were a thought, right? We believe that Brooklyn is uh, a good area to continue to build in and be a part of. I think that there has been some slight uh, single-digit, perhaps, compression on pricing. Uh, or one could say the market is flat uh, to an extent, but we're uh, very bullish on the market, and specifically, we're going to be uh, bringing to the marketplace uh, a large job, a couple of hundred thousand square feet, which we'll be announcing shortly, which further validates our desire to continue to build there. We think that if you build at a certain price point, uh, specifically in the five to seven hundred dollar per square foot price point range uh, there's no lack of buyer for that uh, price point of product and that's the market that we kind of chase if you will so uh, i don't think that we're necessarily building uh, you know phenomenal product like what what uh, what dean's doing as far as with package of amenities um, i think we're building a little bit of a different product a mid-rise as opposed to a high-rise um, unit that caters to a buyer that uh, that might not necessarily be able to afford uh, a Manhattan environment, if you will, but is perfectly pleased to be a part of what what Brooklyn has to offer, and therefore is you, you, is buying. From what you're saying on the project that you're going to announce, you're doing like what is in the in Jersey City, where the light rail is, or Hoboken. So you're you're within downtown Brooklyn. Because a lot of the, those those products are available for the four to five hundred, five hundred to six hundred dollar range, as opposed to the prime sites where they can go by ferry across. So uh, on that, Timmy, what are, what are you seeing with regard to prices of land and property happening in downtown Brooklyn today? Well, they haven't yet repealed the law of supply and demand, so there's a very finite uh, supply. The demand is very very strong. You know, you made a you started the question earlier talking about did these guys need to get in the ground by the end of the year and you know, projects on this scale 
weren't conceived in the last year or two. These guys have all been thinking about this and working on this for a long time. So Brooklyn's been under more of a microscope recently, but that's simply because more and more people are now seeing what's been going on for quite some time. But you know, uh, but there are people who sat with properties in downtown Brooklyn saying, you know, th th you know, it's like Norman Sterner once saying to me on the show, he said, airplanes go up, college tuition goes up, everything goes up, so I think everything is always going to go up. Prices are going to always increase. Unfortunately, there are, there are owners of land and I think David Kramer said it to me on my show, he said, who felt that their property was worth $200 a developable foot. Now that there is a change in the potential men, uh, legislation of the tax abatement, these properties aren't worth that type of money. So uh, unfortunately, I hate to agree with Nor disagree with Norman, but prices can go down. Well, planes go up, but planes come down. And, you know, Anyone who thinks that the price of real estate is going to just go up day after day, I think, is misleading themselves. Historically speaking, uh, over decades, that is clearly the trend. In some decade, I mean, I remember this business in the 70s and the 80s, for example, when you had stagflation and, and peakable buildings and all kinds of other issues where markets went sideways. But people who walked away from whatever was going on then, if, if they hung in there, they may look like heroes today. Yeah. What's the difference between a visionary and a bankrupt developer? What is it? A day and a dollar. Mm. Good one. <laughs> you know, I think we're focusing a lot on, on residential. Now, you're building, Phil, the, this large complex, how many units? 650. 650 units. Um, downtown Brooklyn, I mean, Fulton Street has a certain type of, we will say, cachet based on their type of stores. I mean, is retail really growing in downtown Brooklyn? We know that Atlantic Yards has, you know, Atlantic Yards, uh, that neighborhood. But you are saying that you foresee, do you see a supermarket perhaps opening in yours, a, a pharmacy opening up in your property? Uh, maybe not in our property directly, but there certainly is going to be enough. 24-hour uh, demand in the area, given all the all the construction that's happening. You, you, much, you will definitely see a Dwayne Reed. You know what? <laughs> that's for that's sure. That's like the <laughs> Applebee's in New Jersey. You know, as somebody said when I did a Jersey City show, oh, we have a an Applebee's and a Dwayne Reed. Yeah, that that's not unusual. Downtown thing. Brooklyn does have an Applebee's. Probably does um, well. Uh, in, in, on Fulton Street. Right, but the. Downtown Brooklyn is just like all of Brooklyn. It's very, very understored and underserviced. But with all of the residential development that's going on and all of the different constituencies that you have in downtown Brooklyn that include college students, office workers, and today even tourists, there will be much more retail being built. It's something that we're seeing tremendous interest in, and that's where prices in the last couple of years have indeed skyrocketed. But you know, that's an interesting question. I'll get off the retail for a second. What type of people, what was the profile of a person who bought in your apartments, you know, in downtown Brooklyn near the Gowanus and, you know, uh, going into the Carroll Gardens section and your type of patient, uh, uh, of your profile? What, what are they? Are they New York? Are they from Manhattan? Are they out of towners? Or like, like Timmy was saying before, many of them may be parents of kids who would want to buy things? Well, we're, see we're seeing a lot of uh, sometimes parents buying for their kids, uh, young adults are just moving to New York, but we're also seeing people from Brooklyn wanting to be closer and having less of a commute to Manhattan and having the same services. Uh, we're seeing young couples. Um, I haven't and, seen you know, too many carriages on uh, uh, on Flappish Avenue. I'm sorry to say. I think uh, I think that yeah, it's, it's on a, Montague Street, you can't get down the block some days for strollers and dog wishes. Even, but that's Brooklyn Heights, Timmy. Okay, if Avalon Bay could build in Brooklyn Heights, the forty dollars a square foot rent that they're planning on Myrtle Avenue would be seventy dollars. Correct. It's two different neighborhoods, even though it's but so families. Close. But families, by definition, mean strollers and dogs I, and I retail. Would, I would just interject. We, we're discussing the constellation of who's the buyer, and I would go in a different direction a little bit and tie it in with retail by saying that if you happen to look at the uh, New York Times last week and you notice the design section, y you have two of the nine uh, stores that are actually being uh, 
considered as, as arbiters of design in Brooklyn. So what we're finding, separate and aside from parallel, paralleling what Dean had mentioned, is that there is a percentage of the buyer, and I think it's probably skewed towards a significant percentage of buyer, that has some type of creative element, if you will, to their household component, whether it be someone that's in graphic arts or someone that's in the, the media industry. But there's definitely a creative uh, element to the buyer, if you will, in some sorts. I, I'm not generalizing here or trying to, but I'm just trying to give a, your viewers a little bit of perspective of, of uh, who that buyer is. And um, I think it's kind of America's bohemia, if you will. You know, that, that I thought I, bohemia was Williamsburg. That's oh. You know, if Brooklyn, if the, if the city of New York is a melting pot, Brooklyn is the crock pot. And everybody gets thrown in there and you come out with a stew that's just uh, as interesting as you'll ever find. Let's, let's get, you know, uh, so I hear retail, there are rumors, and I think they're better than rumors, that a Trader Joe's will open, a, a Dwayne Reed will open. There are Dwayne Reeds in, in, in the... On Montague Street and other parts, uh, you know. There was a Dwayne Reed on Myrtle. Right. There's a, and there may be, you know, a Starbucks in, in the Oro or something like that, or in your place. Um, what about hospitality? You know, until Josh, it took Josh Muss 20 years to build the first the hotel. This year, last September, he reopened. He put uh, an addition of 285 rooms. Sam Chang, who's been on my show uh, last week, said that he's building three or four hotels. What do we see in hotels? What, what, what do you think the hospitality market? You know, people want to be in Manhattan. When they come in here, they say, I, I don't want to be in downtown Brooklyn. I mean, the international traveler. I mean, it's getting a good bug, but I mean, what about hospitality? We like hospitality. Uh we think the market's strong in downtown Brooklyn. We're actually uh, going to be filing a job very soon. Uh, we're going to be building one of the larger hotels in the Gowanus area. And, uh, How many rooms? Uh, we're doing 120 rooms, 60 cars, and uh, we're going to have two wonderful restaurants uh, with one having the ability to have the community as well as the guest uh, have rooftop dining. Uh, we'll have an outdoor cafe setting that will bounce off of the Thomas Green Park, if you will. And we think that the traveler that will be geared towards our hotel, and it will be a nationally flagged hotel, uh, it will be a forward, uh, architecturally distinct building. And we think that the traveler that we're catering to is more of uh, the traveler that is, that is interested in a lifestyle, if you will, when they come and visit. And uh, so we'll be creating that experience and giving them hopefully a little bit of a taste of the Gowanus. But but, and, you, uh, you, but you're not you're going to have a taste, but it's going to be a boutique, but a flag boutique. Well, and that's what it sounds like. I mean, um, because you're going to have a flag for good reason, Mike. Because I think that all of us will agree that uh, that the marketplace in the Gowanus is not yet defined, despite the fact that the hotels that are there are doing phenomenally well by any stretch of the imagination. And so we, we're doing it just as a, uh, a safety, if you will, in that uh, I know no, this. I, I think it's a very good idea. Now, you know, I, I just want to get on Gowanus, uh, Phil. I mean, you guys look all around. Have you looked at the Gowanus as a residential potential market? No, not yet. I mean, we looked at, uh, we looked at Williamsburg three years ago, four years ago, and it was too expensive even then. So we, you know, we have to be we have to be really on the edge um, to make it uh, make it work so that it, it can rent for for rent that people are uh, can afford to pay. Timmy, on the hospitality, your thoughts? Well, you said earlier how it took uh, the Musk family a long time to get started, but that goes back to would we have flunk ten years ago that Brooklyn looks the way that it does today? And I think there's probably almost a dozen hotels on the drawing board in a radius of a mile or two of Musk's current. Uh, Marriott, and I think they're all going to do well. And I think that Mark makes the right point that each of them is going to cater to a specific part of the marketplace. Some people stay at the Marriott. I had a friend who came in from Chicago recently. He came to the Marriott, never went to Manhattan. He was happy to visit just Brooklyn. And I think you're going to see more and more of that where it's going to become a destination. I'm fascinated at night to see the tour buses that are, that are driving through Brooklyn and double-decker buses just full of people shooting pictures 
of what some of them would be buying. What is yeah. it? Three million people? Four million people? How many people in well, the popu population of Brooklyn? If it's Brooklyn was a standalone city, it would be the numbers around four million. It'd be the third largest in the country. And before what most people think of as the great mistake, it was a, a, a tremendous city, and it still is in many ways. And uh, there are, and, and you know, we keep talking about downtown Brooklyn, but and that's kind of stretches. There's a lot of neighborhoods that encompasses, but in that area, you've got seven world-class uh, colleges. You've got a couple of hospitals. We're going to have a dozen hotels. The BAM Cultural District is something where. Uh, 20 years ago, my wife for 45 years ran a little dance studio on Flatbush Avenue and used to have her performances at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I was there with her on Saturday for the, a Brooklyn Phil event, and that neighborhood has changed again so dramatically. It's like my example of earlier that you would, you could think you were in a, on a different planet. So there's so much the creativity that you spoke about before is all happening. There are so many cultural venues there. You know, there's not much of a. Not really much of a Brooklyn discount. I mean, in Brooklyn Heights, for example, there's you, none. You there's the a same. premium. There's a premium. It's not a discount. Yeah. And that I think speaks volumes. And and that's why the tour buses are here. And that's why people are building. And that's why again, back to supply and demand. The, the demand is very very strong. I, I mean, I just think the hotel. Thing. The hotel offers the model offers a chance to get a higher revenue stream to overcompensate for either land higher prices. land prices or construction right, but, but, you prices, know, you, you and it a, operates as a you business. Know, you talk about different. The Gowanus, I could see what you're doing. I don't see, uh, uh, unless I'm incorrect, I don't see a hotel in Dumbo. Dumbo, which is downtown, down under the But you Manhattan. can walk to the Marriott. No, I agree, but there is, you know, Dumbo has some very uniqueness. It, it, it's, it's a separate community. It truly is a separate community. Uh, you know, you're right near the water. You have this, you know, it... it it's a, it's a hot neighborhood, you know. I, I don't if see anything. If somebody would have built a small hotel right at the base by where the ferry comes in, I think that they could do uh, an insane business there. At the end of the process, when we just had an uh, an analyst come in from uh, from outside of town, it seems as if for the most part, you know, at least what I'm finding is there's some very accomplished uh, hotel consultants certainly in the city, but there's also a bigger universe out of there, uh, out besides the city, and therefore there's a lot of hotel consultants that usually fly into our city and give us a little bit of a microscopic view of what's going on in Manhattan, or for that matter, in Bu Brooklyn. And I think, for the most part, it comes down to where's the visitor coming from? And it's not yet defined where the visitor's coming from in Brooklyn. We all have a, a macro understanding that it could be that corporate traveler, it could be that, you know, uh, family that wants to stay and visit their kid or whoever it is, but it's not yet clear, at least in my mind, where that visitor is coming from. Even though we've got this macro idea and we we discuss how it's going to um, work off of the business that potentially Manhattan can't carry, um, I'd like to add, just kind of switching a little bit the conversation that. When we talk about Manhattan and we talk about Brooklyn, one of the things that I always find interesting is when you look at the history of Brooklyn, you have Prospect Park, which is 526 acres of great beauty that a lot of people certainly, you know, uh, take part in, in enjoying. You've got the Wallman Rink, which is the same person that underwrote the Wallman Rink here in, uh, in Central Park. You've got the same architect that actually created the park and also created, uh, I'm sorry, Central Park and also created uh, Prospect Park. So I think that you know, if you were to look at what's going on in downtown Brooklyn, I would say that over time, the Brooklynite might very well start going to Kensington, Windsor Terrace, other locales, because they might not necessarily want to be a part of the Manhattanization, if that's a world, of downtown Brooklyn, you know, the high rises. But, you know, Phil's building in Long Island City, there is a distinct difference between Long Island City and downtown Brooklyn. I mean, you. The, Two totally different places. I mean, industrial, I mean, with the exception of where you're building, you know, there are these spot builders, I call, mm -hmm. that, that really haven't. Downtown Brooklyn, or, you know, getting to the Heights and others, there's a community, and it has people. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> downtown Brooklyn could probably absorb four or five hotels. The only problem that I see with the hospitality industry with five or six hotels opening up in downtown Brooklyn is that there are 12 hotels opening up in downtown Manhattan. So many of these hotels 
where people might want to be in downtown in lower Manhattan, you know, they went to downtown Brooklyn, they are going to be competing with each other. Those, I think that's where the competition is. I think that's the competition also with residential. I think certain of the people who might be buying in the Oro or buying in your property or renting in your property would have rented, you know, in Litwin's property on Barclay Street, you know. Um, it's well, a, with us, it's different because we're, our supply is so constrained. There are only, there are only so many places that, that you can afford to build, build rentals around New York. And so I think the same renter would look at Long Island City and downtown Brooklyn just because there are not that many options. And so they'd say, you know, you have a view, you have a downtown, you have one subway, you know, you have all these trade-offs, but you don't have that many choices. And if, you're, if you can't afford to live in Manhattan, uh, you know, and rent and and rent uh, rent in Manhattan. It's it's a very limited. Uh, but you know, on the uh, well, what I just said on the condo. I mean, downtown Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan, it's not that it's not that big of a differential. If you're talking eight hundred dollars a square foot in your building, and you go over into over into Lower Manhattan, you're talking a thousand dollars a foot. And for my viewer, there's another difference. You have a tax phase in. Yeah. 15 years. 15 years, while many of the conversions uh, in Lower Manhattan, they have full tax abatement. It's not a, a phase-in. They have a full tax. So what's happening is some of the properties that you're doing are competing, you know, with, 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 uh, with Lower Manhattan. Whereas our property downtown is getting $75, $80 a square foot in rent. Um, that's and, not that uh, town. That's the hip Lower right. East Side. Right. I mean, that's the the Bowery. You know, that, that's the neighbor neighborhood. That, that's a that's a different market. Uh, you know, we don't have much time, but you know, let's move a little bit over. You know, Fairway opened up in Red Hook. Uh, what what's happening in Red Hook, um, Timmy? You you know that market. Your guys know everything in downtown in Brooklyn. I think it's the same type of issue where it's. What we couldn't have seen five years ago in downtown Red Hook today doesn't look like it's ready or it's there, but the critical mass is coming together, and I think in five or seven, and it may take eight or nine, but at some point in time, it's going to be a, a bustling, it, it is a bustling neighborhood today. Right, but you know, the, the difference, what Phil said before, and what was alluded by, by mm -hmm. uh, Dean and Mark, is that there's good transportation in downtown Brooklyn. Red Hook has yeah limited a or no challenge. transportation and, and I think that is something that really has will have an effect on what happens you know uh, Greenpoint the, Greenpoint also is weak in transportation and there's a lot going on there but for us it's for our for the renters it's convenience it may not be glamorous it may not be uh, you know have other aspects but it's going to be convenient you know uh, Half an hour goes a short time, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring back you guys uh, next season probably when we talk about downtown Brooklyn. But I'd like to thank all, all of you today, giving my viewers a perspective on what's happening in downtown Brooklyn. Mark Freud, uh, principal of the Trapper Companies, best of luck on your new property. Dean Palin, good friend, uh, president of Palin Enterprises, only sell more units at the Oro. Uh, the kings of residential and commercial properties. Uh, Tim King, senior partner at Massinaco Realty Services, and last but not least, the 800-pound gorilla, Phil Wharton, uh, Vice President of Development of Avalon Bay Communities. Uh, see you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Greenberg Traurig LP, The Moynian Group. Additional funding is provided by Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, Cushman and Wakefield, Essex Capital Partners, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Must Development LLC, Newmark Knight Frank, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers.